I was working on a rather benign article for the pressed periodical. And while interviewing a local cidery, I had the most wonderful realization. So I started with making what uh, folks call bilge wine, where you just take like the nasty, you know, powdered juice from the galley, and uh, I'd smuggle some yeast packets, and I would make like a bilge wine, and it was terrible. I think cider could be punk. We're to prove that this beatific vision has any sort of merit. We must search for signs of punk's two core elements, a strive to experiment and a strong, well-connected DIY community. The last year that I made cider at home before starting the business, I made 500 gallons, which is exactly twice the legal limit for alcohol production in the United States. I'm uh, Nat West of Reverend Nat's Hard Cider. I think everybody has a story about cider. And for some people that story is like, you know, some people story about tequila, maybe like drinking too much, and they think that's what cider is. And I don't want my cider to be exactly like the folks down the road. I don't want it to be just a run of the mill of, you know, like a Bud Light of ciders. I always approached it with a beer drinker's mentality because most of what I drink is beer, but I also like cocktails a lot. I wanted my customers to come in and be like, Whoa! It's bubble gum. And maybe they like it, maybe they don't. It's okay. But I also really like ciders that don't just taste like apple. Let's throw some dandelions in there. I had a crazy idea, maybe five years ago, to put pie in cider. Peach and ancho chili pepper. You're not allowed to put any grain in cider. It's against the law. So I got busted by the federal government for that. And uh, I just like an eclectic experience like that to where every tasting tray is different. I found that I was making cider in a very different way than the books were telling me to make cider. Then there's the tent show. The tent show is really why I exist as a cider maker. It's the opportunity to try new things, experiment. It'll, it'll be good. It might be incredible. It'll always be unusual. And I'm never going to make it again. Uh, there's no price constraints, because if I find that I want to put gold flake in a, in a cider, I'll just charge what it takes to do that. One of our most famous tent show projects is the cider called Wooden Hellfire. Between 16 and 18 percent alcohol. It's black. That's actually funny. It's the only cider that I make that is only apple. I'm choosing to sort of advance the message of cider by making cider and making unusual ciders that maybe challenge people's perspective about what cider should taste like. We found signs of experimentation, but do these cideries interact with each other? Do they help those around them, those in need? Do they have a strong community? It's not necessarily like a competitive, it's a complementary type of business. It's very tight knit. Everybody has something that's special to them. We all feel that we can do well when, when more cider is consumed in general. We don't need to be fighting over the same piece of the pie. I was just uh, yesterday talking to another cider maker here in town about their the labels on top of their kegs. I had a question about what label they were using versus what we were using, and he was super helpful. I have different series of ciders. So um, I have some that go for a community series, which usually goes to a food bank. I kind of dedicate a percentage of profits to them. My keg washer broke uh, a couple of months ago, and I trucked a bunch of kegs over to a different brewery in town, and we washed kegs there. While I was traveling in Cambodia, I met this fella who, at one point, he was involved with like the Khmer Rouge. He defected against him, and he's dedicated his life to removing landmines in Cambodia. And when I met and I saw what this guy was doing, I was like, wow, all right, I'm going to make a cider for you. <laughs> it's really fun to be able to work with other cider companies in the Pacific Northwest who are making very, very different ciders than me or approaching cider in a very different place. You know, Fin River is like a farm. They're, they're called Farm and Cidery. Uh, they grow a lot of their own apples and they're really into salmon and community building. And I'm in a super urban environment. There's loud trains outside and there's gravel everywhere and no trees. So I do a ton of events. And so we did like a fun holy festival. We did a Highland Games. It's clear they have a strong community, so much so that we even got invited to a cider symposium to shake hands with some of the biggest names in the industry. Let's see what they have to say. 
Uh, yeah. Cider's punk. Yeah, I'd say it's a pretty punk beverage. I would say cider is punk. Yeah. My name is Andrew Byers. Um, I'm the head cider maker at Finn River Cidery, and I'm also the vice president of the Northwest Cider Association. No, categorically, I don't think cider is punk. So, if you don't think cider is punk, how do you feel about experimental ciders like the Tent Show at Reverend Nat's? Why are there so many people that are so interested in the novelty of cider? A good cider should show intentional balance. I appreciate the brand identity that Nat has brought to the table. Uh, where's your balance? Where's your intention? I mean, they literally had a bottle with chunks of pie at the bottom of it. So if Finn River isn't about experimenting with new cider flavors, um, what are you bringing to the table? The Gen Zers and uh, millennials alike want a curated selection. Here's three ciders, two cheeses, and some bread. But then at the same time, they want connection to place. You choose Finn River because you support and you identify with Finn River values. And so that's what we're getting at. It's a lifestyle brand. Maybe he's right. Maybe cider isn't punk. He certainly made a pretty good case for it. I guess this project isn't as cut and dry as I originally thought. Are people going to think this is a cop-out? Probably, but eh.